hear you a little bit more. So, first of all, I would rather be preaching a sermon now than delivering a talk, to be honest, um, because I love the Word of God, and I love being able to talk to you about it. Not that this is not a good thing, it's a great idea. Um, and, and secondly, you know everything that I think already. I think you do. Because if I think it, I throw it into a sermon somewhere along the way. I, I figured out um, how to get in the things that I'm concerned about and want to talk about. The reason that uh, we decided to do a q and A is is that it would sort of uh, lighten up our load a little bit. That was a part of it. But more importantly than that, um, we've attended many conferences where they would open up for a and a for the, the speakers or visiting speakers or pastors and um, some of the, the best things I've ever learned were in some of the Q&As. I can still remember a Q&A that I listened to from John MacArthur when I was uh, in high school. And he was uh, giving some defenses over some of the doctrines that he was teaching. And I can still hear the quotes, and it was impacting, and it makes a difference. So uh, this could be really good. So I'm going to throw a question to James, first of all, and, and then we'll, we'll share a few things along the way. I have a question for you. You've been here for a while. Uh, what has been the most surprising and perhaps the most delightful thing that you've experienced in ministry in your first year? Um, probably Christian fellowship. Okay. So, yep. The fellowship of the body here is uh, just phenomenal. I grew up in a church where people came fairly early because they wanted to talk. People left pretty late because they wanted to talk. Sometimes there was a deacon turning light, lights out on people because uh -huh. he wanted to go home. Right. Um, and this church is so similar in that regard. So that is probably, yeah, the most delightful thing um, in my experience. Yeah. And it's true Christian fellowship because mm -hmm. we're all delighting in the same Lord. Mm -hmm. We're all believing the right doctrine the right, about the gospel, the right mm -hmm. gospel. So, yeah. Good. Um, often when we have speakers in, uh, missionaries and others, they always say there's something unique here in the way that people stay together and talk and the love that you have. And so I, I believe that is true. And so I'm, I'm glad to have you say that. What's your biggest concern? I don't know. What was my yeah, biggest concern? Good. Um, my biggest concern for myself is that I would do something really stupid and compromise my ministry and harm the body. Um, if I can just open my heart up a little sure. bit. Sure, yeah. Um, something disqualifying. There's nothing on that I'm like, you know, that's right. like right there about to swallow me that I need to confess. But mm -hmm. Good. I've seen that story too many times. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen an associate split, the ch split a church because yeah. he wasn't careful. Um, so yeah, that would be, I guess that would be my biggest concern just myself, but mm -hmm. okay. I don't know that I could say everyone has this problem that I think mm -hmm. that might, might be a little arrogant. Okay. Uh, so. All right. So do we have a microphone that's going to be traveling? Nancy has one of those, and I'm just hoping that you get it ready, and then you can go in a minute or two. You want to, do you have any questions you wanted to ask me, first of all, similar to those? Well, I, um, <clears throat> I got to have lunch with the Johns family today before they headed back home up in Calumet. And I said, so if you were going to ask Pastor any question out of the Bible, what would it be? So it's not so much that. It's a Bible content question. It's, mm -hmm. just, it's how to understand something. And, and um, Emma Johns, her question was, it says that Moses spoke to God face to face, mm -hmm. as with a friend, and yet um, later on, I think in the very next chapter, uh, it says no one may see him and live. Mm -hmm. So what, what did it mean that he spoke to God face to face? So. Okay. So in Exodus, I think it's chapter 24, it talks about the elders going up onto the mountain. Mm -hmm. And uh, it says that they saw God and they ate and drank, which is really puzzling, of course, after what it talks about with Moses and the people. Um, I would start with at, at least a consideration of saying, 
that the, the person of God in the Old Testament is always Christ. And so, um, at least generally Christ, I don't want to overstate that. Mm -hmm. So there's a sense in which Christ is there. Uh, there might be a theophany, which would be an appearance of, of Christ. I'm most inclined to say that his glory was there and that as Moses entered into the glory of God, uh, we read that in 2 Corinthians 3.18, he would go up and, and the glory transfigured the face of Moses that uh, there was still a distance, that there was still some kind of separation so that when you get to Exodus chapter 34, when, when the Lord uh, allowed Moses to see his glory, it was like mm -hmm. the afterburner. Mm -hmm. So there, there has to be somewhat of a, of a distance. So I still don't believe that anyone has ever seen God the Father, and I don't think that they saw Christ in his glory, which would be equal to the Father's at the same time. So a filter, maybe? I'm, I'm not sure. What do you think? Well, that means I got it right. So, yeah, when I answered. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I said I, I think it. it was the Son of God. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, we're going to open it up now? I think so, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> that is awesome. Yes. In John chapter 14, mm -hmm. Philip saith unto him, show me the Father, and uh, have I been with you so long, and, and you don't know? Have you seen me? You've seen the Father. Mm -hmm. There are two different words that are being used there for seen in John 14, and in a sense what Jesus is saying, if you have observed me, you have comprehended completely the Father. And so I would say he's not really talking about in the visual external sense, but in the real essence of the person, we know exactly what God the Father is like as we watch, as we are able to watch Jesus as he interacts, interacts with people. Mm -hmm. and, and I think throughout all of eternity, that will be the way that we come to know the Father better, better excuse me, is through the Son, even. You want to add to that? I think that would connect to um, we beheld his glory. Oh, sure. And it's like, well, yeah, but if you beheld his glory, I mean, zap, you're gone, right? right. And so it's, it's, there's something to do with beholding him, his glory, or John says in First John that the message he preached was that God mm -hmm. is light and in him is no darkness at all. So it's using those words, I think, not just to mean literally like the Shekinah glory, because right. Jesus didn't show that in, except at the Mount of Transfiguration, but um, that in his character, in knowing him as a person, you are knowing his glory, you're beholding his glory. Mm -hmm. So I think that connects. Mm -hmm. yeah. how, how do you think, it says in the text, was it like John 1, 18, and the word became flesh, and we beheld his glory. Is, is there some connection between how he manifested himself in earthly fashion and his glory? I would, at first blush, I would tend to think it's, <clears throat> it's that he's not... Um, he may, he may have hidden like the full expression of his, mm -hmm. of his glorious divine nature um, uh, in human flesh, but that in knowing him, you're still fully knowing God, mm -hmm. I think. Okay. I, to, I don't I, know if that answers the question. I agree with that completely. Yeah. I might even add, and I wasn't trying to add in, but it occurs to me that in the resurrection, I think there would be a, a sense in which they would truly see Additionally, the glory of God mm -hmm. as they saw the resurrected Christ mm -hmm. and all that he was. So. Amen. And we There's got one back there, yeah. There we go. Over to Mr. Willis. Great. Hi, Gary and Laura. There are many viewpoints of the second coming of Christ, why do you believe it will be pre-tribulational? The return of Christ as, as why do we believe in a pre-tribulational rapture? Okay. Um, we both have plenty of opinions on that. You, you want to go first? And then I'll, I'll, I'll be clean up and... Yeah, yeah. So really clean up here. Um, <laughs> really. 
pick and everything up. The, uh, the biggest reason will be in um, 1 Thessalonians. Mm -hmm. As I flip to Hebrews, that's the wrong direction. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. <clears throat> um, he says... He doesn't want them to be concerned because uh, about those who fell asleep in the Lord, so those who didn't live to see the return of Christ. Turns out none of them were going to live to see the return of Christ. But they had thought that if you weren't physically alive, maybe you're going to miss it. He says, no, you're all going to, you're all going to go together. In fact, the dead will actually beat you to it. Um, they'll be re they will rise first. Um, and then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together. So that's talking about the rapture. And then in chapter 5, he says um, in verse 9, God has not appointed us for wrath, mm -hmm. but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And <clears throat> the way the system is put together, the way it, the scripture seems to be talking about it, is that the entire tribulational period is the day of wrath. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of arguments about what constitutes the day of the Lord, the day of wrath, to what you know, how far does it extend on either side of the tribulational period? Um, but uh, some people hold what would be called a pre-wrath view, where they, they hold that the last three and a half years are the only, the only part of the tribulation that's wrathful. But the Antichrist reigns the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, ascends, I mean, he's, he's fighting it out with other nations on the earth and stuff. And, um, and so there's... There's conflict, but the Antichrist himself is part of the wrath of God. So the whole seven years needs to be understand, mm -hmm. understood, at least the whole seven years, as the wrath of God. Um, and so when he says we're not destined for wrath here in 1 Thessalonians um, 5, verse 9, it's pretty clear that if, if the bride of Christ was left, the bride of Christ would be in the day of wrath. Now, there's some arguments to say that, well, yeah, but just like Israel and Goshen didn't experience the plagues that were on Egypt, so the church wouldn't have to experience the direct wrath of God. But I think categorically or definitionally, by being in that period, you're in, you're in the wrath of God. You're in the day of wrath. Um, and in the second letter to Thessalonians, Paul's mm -hmm. comfort to them in chapter 2 that, that they haven't seen this man of lawlessness, the whole thing, when you read it, it seems to, it, it really, in my opinion, only makes sense if, if he's saying, like, that um, they haven't, they don't, they, he says, don't think you're in the day of the Lord. We ask you, brothers, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ our, and our gathering together to him, not be quickly shaken in your mind or alarmed whether by a spirit or a word or a letter, as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So day of the Lord, that's day of wrath. That's, mm -hmm. those would be, we need to equate those two. Let no one in any way deceive you. It has not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, um, who opposes and exalts himself uh, above every so-called God or object of worship, worship, but he takes his seat in the sanctuary of God, that's a temple, exhibiting himself as being God. So the, the hope hmm. that seems to be mm -hmm. like behind this is you know you're not in the day of the Lord. And you, the only way you could be in the day of the Lord is if you saw this stuff happening. And I think when you take that together with chapter 4, you realize we're not going to see that happening. Um, so that would be, hmm. clean that up. I think Good. A, lot, lots of stuff to, yeah. to think through there. Um, if you would compare John chapter 14 with what Jesus says with Revelation chapter 19. Uh, in Revelation 19, it's clear that Christ is coming from heaven, coming to earth, landing on the ground, and is exacting punishment. None of that is true about uh, John 14, where he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And he tells us that he's going to take us to heaven rather than come back to the earth and deal with this on the earth. So we know that the first or, or the second coming and the rapture are different in two dozen different ways. One is to earth, one is to heaven, one is private, one is public, one is for the saints, one is 
to judge the world. And that, that list can go on and on about the differences between them. Um, we get our first hint of the rapture in Luke 21, 35, in which Jesus says, pray that you would be counted worthy to escape all of these things. And so he just gave the, the Olivet Discourse in Luke 21. Everything is going to happen, the wars and rumors of wars and everything. He says, we can escape all of that. So we're not even going to be there, just like James was saying. And it's identical to Revelation 3.10, which I think is one of your favorite verses on, on the rapture, that we are kept not from the tribulation, but from the hour of tribulation, which is to come on all of the world. So we're going to be taken out of that whole time period uh, rather than just be protected in the midst of it uh, along the way. And I would just say that because Christ loves the church and Christ is the judge, there's no way he's going to leave us in the way as he casts his wrath on the world. And it's very interesting, Jeremiah 31, that the tribulation is called Jacob's trouble. It's not the church's trouble or, or whatever. It is the time in which the Lord purifies the nation of Israel and brings them back to the Lord. So we can't be a part of it. And as everyone has noticed, when you read in the book of Revelation, uh, the word church is mentioned repeatedly in, in 1, 2, and 3. And then once you get to chapter 4, when he talks about the things that shall be, the church just drops out of the, the discussion. There's no mention of the church at all until the church returns with Christ in chapter 19 back to the earth. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, when I was younger in school, there was a time in which, based on a couple of verses, I was doubting a pre-tribulational rapture and took some time to, to really think about it. And I've become more and more convinced and more clear throughout all of my, the rest of my life in ministry that it is a pre-tribulational rapture. Not because we're escapists, you know, because any Christian in China who's suffering, he's going through very bad things. It's not about me. It's not about the fact that I don't have to worry or be prepared. It's simply that Christ loves his church. And in that grand uh, epic of his plan, he won't judge that church, which is his, his, his bride. And any comments on that in addition to that, Gary, that come? Okay. So I think it's true. And, and I've heard from James the same thing, that you were wondering about it and have become more and more convinced over time. Tell yeah. me about that. In, in preaching lab and seminary, so there's a couple different preaching classes you have to take. And we had to do a, a three-sermon series on a New Testament book, on a New Testament mm -hmm. epistle. Okay. So I chose 1 Thessalonians 4. And then the first half of chapter 5, second half of chapter 5. That'd be my mm -hmm. one, two, three. Had to be sequential. Um, and in that study, it just, I mean, it just convinced me. I was mm -hmm. like, I don't, I don't think there's any other way to read this. No. Um, so that was, that was, that was probably the lights out moment. And then the, um, that comment on Revelation, that the church is in the beginning, but then it's nowhere. Um, I had a professor bring that up in in my ordination preparation class. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was also like, oh yeah, it was just, it's just another ingredient that fits and that seems to mm -hmm. confirm that. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Sure. The outline of the book of Revelation is write down the things which you've seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. And so chapter four is the hereafter part. And that's why the church is gone from that. Judah will come see his father. <laughs> so to kind of um, play on that a little bit or keep going with that, <clears throat> um, so many people that would deny, that, that would be opposed to a pre-tribulational rapture would point to Darby as where all of the pre-trib rapture stuff comes to mm -hmm. into the church. I mean, I know like you've spoken before about um, early church fathers that believed it. And I don't know if you can think of any offhand, but could you just elaborate a little bit on the, the history of the church in pre-trib rapture? They're not really as clear on the rapture that I can think of. I know that they were much more clear on the millennium, that they were anticipating uh, a time in which the Lord would, would uh, take it, the church away and then bring us back and there would be a millennium. I think Justin Martyr is like the first one that rings a bell to you who talks about uh, a, a millennial period. Um, 
If I want to talk about church fathers, though, um, Larry Crutchfield wrote a, an article, and he said, when we talk about the church fathers, we should include the biblical writers. And he, he believed very much that John the Apostle and his students, so that would be like Polycarp and, and others which don't come to my mind, that they clearly understood that it would be a pre-tribulational rapture, and it was, um, it was just lost. In fact, I would say that the amillennial perspective uh, came in because the early church was persecuted out of believing in that, and they went to a, a figurative interpretation of the scriptures. So that's not a great answer, but that's what comes to my mind. Okay. That's great. And, and the, the whole excuse of Darby is, is just goofy. There, there's all these uh, other apocryphal ideas that there was a young lady that had a dream about the rapture and that those things started in, in about the 18th century. And there's no truth to it at all, no, no bearing on reality mm -hmm. whatsoever. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, Nancy. <laughs> So we've learned a few times here, Pastor, that um, Psalm 110, it's where David is saying, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. We've heard that spoken by Jesus to prove his deity. I'm still confused by that verse. So I was wondering if you guys could talk through it because the first verse says, the Lord says to my Lord, in my version, I've got Lord in capital letters as the first Lord. And then that second word, Lord, is lowercase. Mm -hmm. And I'd just like you guys to, to uh, clarify for me, is the first Lord God and the second one Jesus? Or who are these two Lords that are described in this verse? I, I'm very interested to see what legacy does with Yahweh and Adonai. Do you mind reading it from your text? Yeah, it says, Yahweh says to my Lord, okay. sit at my right hand until I put your enemies as a footstool for your feet. Yahweh will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, have dominion in the midst of your enemies. And that's, yep, that's probably good. Yeah. So just noticing what we just heard, which is when he says, Yahweh said to my Lord, that means that David is a witness and he's listening to a conversation or a, really a divine counsel between two people. We know that one of them is, is Yahweh, but you know, we would know his Lord is Jehovah, um, but Adonai is the term for my Lord. So uh, the version chose not to translate it as a proper noun or name, Adonai. Right. And uh, they, they used it as my Lord, which is an adjective of description. But it's clearly uh, Yahweh said to Adonai, you just sit down and you take a break. I'm going to make this happen. So David is a witness to the divine counsel of member number one talking with member number two mm -hmm. about what's going to happen. So how does that relate to Christ and his deity then? Was, was that the third question? Okay. Yeah, I, in, in Hebrews, that's where um, Scripture really kind of hammers that out. And, and his point is that, um, that when you understand that with, um, with the... Uh, with other texts here, let me see here. So he says in, in chapter one of Hebrews, he, he says that God spoke to us formerly by the fathers and the prophets, but now he's spoken to us in his son, mm -hmm. whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's glorious. He's the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature. So it's kind of like he's God. If you didn't get that, he's God. If you didn't get that again, he's God. Um, having accomplished cleansing for sins, it says after the crucifixion um, and resurrection and apparently ascension, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, mm -hmm. and that's alluding to that verse, mm -hmm. having become so much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. And he goes through this basically saying, the Lord Jesus is the greatest of like all creatures, basically, not saying he's created. Um, and so he's better than angels, right? Which, to which of the angels did he ever say, you're my son, today I've begotten you? And again, I'll be a father to him, he shall be a son to me. Mm -hmm. says, let the angels of God worship him. Um, 
But to which of the angels has he ever said, skipping a bunch of verses, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies as a footstool for your mm -hmm. feet? And so the author of Hebrews, Paul, is, um, I just threw that out there, okay. for, just, just for chuckles. Um, Great. Yeah. Uh, the author of Hebrews is making the point that um, that verse huh. is connected to understanding how we need to understand like where Christ is as, like in relation to all of creation and stuff. And um, his point is he's better than the angels. Mm -hmm. And before that, in verses 1 through uh, 3, he's fully God. Mm -hmm. Like God by nature God. Um, the mm -hmm. exact representation of his nature. Um, so I would look at that, I think, to answer that. Um, mm -hmm. You can clean that up. No, I don't think I can. Um, Matthew 22 is where we were looking uh, not too long ago, where Jesus used Psalm 110. Uh, if David is his father, how can he therefore call him Lord? And, and Psalm 110 is the most quoted chapter in all of the New Testament because it most clearly defines that Jesus is more than just an angel, but that he is God himself. It's interesting that that was the one question that they couldn't answer. And because the only way it would be possible for David to have his son also be his Lord is if he was divine. And that proved to them, and, and it basically shot them up. And, and they didn't ask him any more questions. So It's interesting, we wouldn't necessarily think that way in, the, in like Western culture. Sure. A son could overshadow his father in Western culture because mm -hmm. we're so individualistic. Mm -hmm. But in their thinking, not only is it his, you know, father or grandfather, great grandfather, whatever, mm -hmm. but it's the, it's David. David yeah. Like this is this is the king of kings that they knew. Hmm. You know, there's gonna, there could be nobody better than David. Hmm. So if there's somebody better than David, like he has to be God. God. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. In in Matthew one one, when it says that Jesus is the son of David, the son of Abraham, it's highlighting David even more than Abraham that Christ is that son of David. Mm -hmm. So whenever you see people wanting a miracle from Christ, they call him the son of David. Mm -hmm. That's a, a unique divine title. So they knew it mm -hmm. even more than we do mm -hmm. today. Scott's got one. Yep. Did that answer the question, Nancy? Is that, is that helpful? I'll, I'll have to think on it some more. Nancy. Further study. Okay. It's still not perfectly clear to me. Okay. So I wonder if you might be able to uh, describe some of the differences that we see in Bible translations, um, particularly the King James, New King James versus the other modern versions. What's going on there? You're closer to seminary. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I know it, but not as well as James. Yeah. I'll, I'll be honest. I'll try to make it succinct. I'm going to be... I first started getting into this when I was listening to James White. Um, I don't agree with James White on everything, but he's really good at answering, um, especially arguments from King James onlyists, which we would, you know, there's the, the King James Bible is, is a wonderful translation. Pastor Jerry has a great phrase, which is, um, uh, it's a really great translation to live by. Mm -hmm. um, so if you live by it, it's great. Mm -hmm. uh, you think of the, like all the Puritans would have. Um, would have been using that Bible or, or the Geneva Bible. So, um, but it, the King James onlyist argument is basically the English itself was like almost inspired or divinely like preserved such that it's the only text we can trust. Mm -hmm. um, and James White has some great comments to, to address that. But the... Um, it's heretical, by the way. That's it, a heretical yeah. view in terms of inspiration. Right. The way we, um, mm -hmm. we, we think the authors were inspired, but the documents were inspired that they wrote. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. Paul wrote you know, everything in, in Greek. Um, and so the New Testament is written in Greek, the Old Testament in uh, Hebrew. We're mainly concerned with the New Testament with these arguments. That just seems mm -hmm. to be where most of the battle is. Um, but he wrote you know, one letter to the Philippians. Okay, So it's on... It's one document on however many pieces of parchment that, or papyrus mm -hmm. that um, 
that it needs to be there, and that's um, that's not a dura not not a durable material, right? It's not encoded in in a, a server somewhere, and as long as that server has power, it's going to be preserved for all time. It's it's handwritten, and it's rolled up, and it's taken by somebody to the Philippian church, and it's read to the unrolled and read to the Philippian church, and um, they would have immediately known this is scripture, mm -hmm. and we need to get this out. Mm -hmm. And so they would have copied it. Um, it was their doctrine of the belief and inspiration of the Old Testament right. that told them that this is a, an additional element. Right. Same Je book. Jesus, I think it's in John 16, pre-authorized the New Testament. Mm -hmm. He told the apostles mm -hmm. that um, the, the helper would come and would lead them into all truth. And um, we tend to think that that's about us being able to understand the Bible, but it's probably about the apostles being able to accurately um, bring the words of Christ to memory mm -hmm. and to, um, to put it into Scripture and to pass it on. Mm -hmm. So anyway, as the Gospels are written and they're, sent and they're given to whoever they're going to give, you know, Luke writes his to Theophilus. And so that's one document going to one guy. So how do we have that? that letter um, and the answer is it was copied but God inspired the what's called the autograph which is what Luke actually wrote he didn't inspire the copy so um, you know if you've ever tried to look at something written and hand write it how many times do you cross something out and put the correct word on top as you're checking it how many times do you go, oh, I like, I dropped a whole sentence, or I repeated the and. I didn't need to repeat that and. I didn't need mm -hmm. to repeat the twice there. Um, and so there's mistakes that get introduced as it's copied. Um, but they're probably copying like, like 10 of these at a time. They're probably, it's probably one guy reading it, and there's 10 people writing it down as mm -hmm. he's reading it. That was one of the ways they did it. Um, there's, a, there's a term for that, and I forget what it's the term. Um, and so they, since they knew this was scripture, they had safeguards in place to check it. So they would then take their, whatever manuscript they're copying. So it would have the, what Luke wrote, they would have copied that, but eventually, you know, you've got a copy that's in this school and, um, that copy is being copied. Okay. And so then they're going to take these 10 copies and they're going to check it against this one and they're going to go word for word they're going to they're going to count the letters in each line and make sure that they agree and they're going to they're going to be very careful um, and their memories were a lot better at being able to store short term memory and repeat it uh, more than ours because we can just google whatever we need um, and so as these are being produced eventually you start to get little variations that happen um, Re regional that are regionalized yeah. so mm -hmm. you got north africa as a region of area around Jerusalem is a region around Syria and Antioch, um, and Asia Minor, and then Rome. And so these are, I guess I'm doing the, the map backwards for you, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so as these are regionalized, you start to, you start to recognize that there's, there's slight variations based on the region you're in, um, but nothing that's compromising the, um, like core doctrines, nothing that's compromising the major storyline, nothing that is, um, it'd be like uh, there's an extra T in the, or they, or, or they, left, off a, they left off a letter at the end of, of a word, or they put, they put a couple words too close together or something, mm -hmm. or, or there was a marginal note that a scribe wrote on the edge of his paper that a scribe like kind of tucked that in and included it accidentally and stuff, but it's nothing that's harming the, the text. Um, but you're, we, we have access to so many of these. And in the 1800s, there was this huge push to go find text, go find documents, go find manuscripts. And so some of the major ones that, that we have now, uh, there's a particular papyrus, I think it's P46 in the Chester Beatty papyri that dates back mm -hmm. to the second century AD. And it has I think most of Paul's epistles. Hmm. Is that right, Scott? You're because you're you're also listening yeah, to the same people. Yeah. So, um, so that's big. I mean, that shows that by the second century, we had like 
all of Paul's letters collected. Mm -hmm. Like we didn't, it wasn't that, you know, um, these were being written in by communities or something. Like these were, these were faithfully recorded and collected and passed down and, and copied and checked and preserved. And the Lord definitely superintended in his preservation. But what you did have is that in the Byzantine church, the Byzantium, that would be modern day Turkey and Eastern Europe, I think, right? Where those connect. Mm -hmm. Istanbul. That was the, so where Istanbul is, that was Constantinople, capital of the Byzantine Empire. The Eastern Roman Empire became what we call the Byzantine Empire. They just called themselves Romans. That's how they saw themselves. Um, uh, but that is where a, a huge number of manuscripts can be found. But they're all of one, I want to say variety, um, of one, is it reading? I'm trying to remember the word. Family is family. Yeah, yeah, that's what it family, is. Yeah. One family. And the King James, when the King James was being translated, they didn't have access to some of the manuscripts that were in North Africa, some of the manuscripts that were in the Jerusalem or Antioch area, but they had access to all of these Byzantine manuscripts because when the Crusades happened a couple hundred years before, the Crusaders brought back a ton of these manuscripts. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Crus I don't, it's just a, for, for your information, in case you don't remember this, the Crusades happened because Istanbul was being threatened by Muslim armies. Mm -hmm. And they said to the West, come help us. And so the Pope called a Holy Crusade and all the Western medieval um, kingdoms sent armies over there to where they sweep down and eventually took over the Holy Land. And so that brought back a, a ton of access to these manuscripts. Um, and so when the King James translators are translating in England in 1611 was the original, I believe, the 1611 King James. Um, they're using this, predominantly this one family of manuscripts, and we call that the majority text, I believe. Um, and <clears throat> in the 1800s, so 200 years later, they're discovering a lot more from all around the world, from, from Africa and stuff. And so now, now these are being considered and analyzed, and, and we're looking at all of them, and we're saying, where do all of them agree? Mm -hmm. Um, because if all of them agree, that's a pretty strong reason to say that's what Luke actually wrote. Or that's what Paul actually wrote. Mm -hmm. So um, when that's called textual criticism, comparing manuscripts and comparing readings. And so our, the two traditions, if you could say it, of translation are majority text and received text, mm -hmm. I think is what they're called. And a modern translation like the New American Standard Bible or the New International Version uh, or the English Standard Version would be from the received text. So that would be considering manuscripts from, um, from all around the world, not just that majority text that are predominantly Byzantine. Um, but the, the King James and the New King James favor that majority text mm -hmm. because their thinking is, this is the most amount of manuscripts has this reading, so we'll go with that. Um, whereas, like, I use the Legacy or the New American Standard Bible. is the, saying the critical text right, side. Yep. It's saying what's, what's the oldest reading. Um, there's a couple different rules to determine which mm -hmm. readings are best. And um, basically, it's what's oldest, what's um, found most often in most places. Um, well, that explains the other right. versions. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's probably very confusing because that's me shooting off the cuff here. But um, it, I think it'd be interesting, I'll, I'll let you finish yeah. in a second, to just define the word critical. Because when you think of like criticism, you think of people that are ungodly and have no interest. People who are doing lower criticism evaluating in text, they're pious, they're, mm -hmm. they love the Lord, they love scripture, and they're, they're using intellect and they're using scholarly study and, and comparison to identify what the original was. And we know right. that we have the original. Right. Well, there are a few places where we're not exactly sure which word it would be, but it's either this one or that one. Mm -hmm. So uh, critical is not a bad thing, it's, it's a good right. thing in, right. in that regard. Yeah, and you can hear this whole talk and go, yikes, it just sounds like we're <laughs> making our best guess at what the Bible actually says. Um, but we can be, I, 
we are more confident uh, that we have what the biblical authors actually wrote mm -hmm. than any other scholar, any other person can have of any other ancient document. There are over 2,000 manuscripts of the New Testament, I think of the Gospels, actually, not just the New Testament. Uh, there's 12 of Plato's. There's, there's, there's less reason to trust that Shakespeare wrote his plays than that the biblical authors actually wrote the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, so there is, there's no reason when you have this conversation to think that, can I really trust what's in here? Is it actually what they said? No, there's every reason when you mm -hmm. look at the history and how it's been preserved and copied and, and, and faithfully transmitted to say, we have the word of God. Is it Daniel Wallace, we have an embarrassment of evidences. We have so much, it's right. like just over the top right. uh, clear. And unbelieving scholars keep trying to come up with reasons to say we can't trust it, but yeah. um, every, every one of their arguments falls short. I'd be interested in talking revival, but let's go with Laura's question, and then we'll, we'll talk about Asbury, yeah. and then see if that prompts other questions, too. When the tribulation is done, and this earth is just ruinated with all the judgment that's been poured upon it, then ushers in the millennium. What's earth going to be like? Is Christ as king coming to rule over this whole planet, will he just snap his fingers and make it all clean again? Or what, what's that going to be like? Wonderful. That's a great question. So. Take it away. Okay. Um, I answered the last one. Sure. So. so it wasn't very long ago that we did a whole series on the millennium in our Sunday school hour and it probably took about 10 weeks to talk about it. Um, the earth of the millennial period will be revamped so that uh, a animals will not have their hostile nature. They'll be changed. The, the wolf and the lamb and, and the lion and the child and the, the adder, they can all be together because no one will hurt anyone, it says, in my holy mountain. So everything will be changed for the better except for humans. Uh, they'll still s still have a sin nature. That's where you get the unbelievers at the end of the millennial period. Um, about a 50-mile or 40-mile square will all be considered the holy district in Israel. Uh, the mountains will go up and valleys, or valleys will be exalted. Mountains will be leveled so that there'll be a district in the very center of the millennial temple, which will be built. It's about a mile square. And so you think of it as a complex. You go in and go through the different gates, and uh, um, we probably will not be uh, immediately given access to go in and see either Christ or David. Both are going to be there. I don't know what Christ will do. He's you know, got a lot going on, I'm sure. But he will be there. That's what we're told. Um, the, the Jewish nation will now function as a kingdom of priests, and so they will be the ones giving the tours, taking us, or at least the mortals, in to either see David to uh, carry on the sacrifices. There will be blood sacrifices in the millennium, um, and they will look forward or look back to what Christ did, and, and will be memorials, and will be expressions of, of the fact that the people want to be forgiven. Um, it usually is shocking when you say there will be blood sacrifices, but the Bible says it, so we, we believe it, and we have to try and understand it. Um, it will just be a wonderful time. Isaiah, is it 65, says that a, a child who dies at 100 years old will be considered, oh, what a shame. He died, you know, just as a baby. So uh, long life for the people. Um, and those who are, are the saints, we will come in our glorified bodies. And so we will interact with them. We'll probably bear witness. We might go serve out in Jupiter and Mars. We're not told anything else about the rest of the universe other than it's brand new. And so um, I, I would say that when, when God gives us a, a window into the millennium or a window into the new heaven and new earth at the end of it, it's kind of like looking in the window. When you look in the window, you can see a lot, but you don't see everything. And so the truth is the eye is not seen and ear has not heard and it hasn't even entered into the heart of man the things that the Lord 
has prepared for us. So um, the millennial period and then beyond that eternity will be so much more wonderful than we could imagine that we can't even describe it. But it'll be wonderful. So any, any particular questions in terms of what will happen are you thinking about or? Like just how will it, how will it be renewed basically? Yeah. Um, I think it'll, I think it, it sounds like the Lord is, he's returning it to Eden-like conditions. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's one of the reasons that you can't get your garden to grow is, is because the curse is in effect and the curse mm -hmm. seems to be getting worse in a way. It's as mm -hmm. if it just, um, the system is just, is just falling apart, you know. Uh, and the further you got from, from the Garden of Eden, the more the system is breaking. And so if he's returning it to that, I think you're going to see really miraculous renewal happening. Uh, and so, uh, yes, I mean, would it, will it be like a wasteland around, around the world when he comes back? Perhaps, but not for long. Um, and who knows if that's not even part of preparing the earth to bounce back really fast when he, when he rejuvenates mm -hmm. it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But after that comes the purging and new heavens, new earth. The world, elements so. will melt with yeah. fervent heat, Second Peter. Yeah. yeah. I make a new heaven and a new earth kind yeah. of a thing. So, good. Well, let's talk revival because I'd hate to lose, lose the time and not talk about that. Um, if you've been watching the news, the news media, those who believe in the Lord and even those who don't necessarily are affirming that there's something wonderful happening at Asbury in Kentucky. Kentucky has often been kind of a center of revivals and Second Great Awakening. Um, there was a, a bunch of revivals that happened there and they tend to be rather controversial. And so even today you're going to hear people talking, is it real, is it not real? Um, I think there are real reasons to be skeptical, and I'll talk about those, or we can talk about those. But before we be become skeptical, I think it's important to stop and, and kind of rehearse the history of revivals for a second. Revivals have had a huge place in our nation's history. Revivals have happened throughout the, the, all the New Testament era. I basically view the Reformation as a revival with Martin Luther and the recovery of of the gospel and, and everything like that. So in our country, when uh, the first great awakening was occurring, uh, there was a man by the name of Gilbert Tennant and he had a couple of sons and they were great preachers and they were preaching truth and people were responding. Um, he preached a sermon called The Dangers of uh, Unconverted Ministry. And so there were a lot of preachers, Presbyterians and whatnot in the early New England era that were probably not even born again. And so they began preaching personal uh, faith that you need to have your own relationship with the Lord. And the established churches at the time, 1720s and 30s, didn't like that. And so they were known as the old lights versus the new lights. And the old lights, they didn't want people coming in saying that you can be born again and, and it's not necessarily based on your infant baptism or your church membership or the fact that you live here. Uh, in a, a community, and we have this church, it was personal. And so they began preaching that, and of course you know the story of Jonathan Edwards, uh, 1734 and 35, and his great sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And, and God began to use his preaching to convict people of their sin, uh, and they were being changed, and, and some of it was, was emotionalized, and some of it wasn't. And so he wrote a book based on uh, his observations, how you can tell the difference between a true revival and a fake one. And a lot of it had to do with emotionalism and was it planned by humans or was it a sovereign act of God, things like that. And so the first Great Awakening was very God-centered and it was a revival and it really was real. So that's the first thing I want to say is it was true. And by saying that it was true, it impacted the nation. I think it impacted our, the Revolutionary War and the kind of people that our nation became at the, the founding of our government. A lot of that happened because of the First Great Awakening. So God can and does do things like that. 
And so as soon as I think that in my mind, that, that God has done this in the past, I want to be kind of careful in not being so quick to condemn if, if I have concerns about something that's happening uh, in the present era, because it would be easy to condemn everybody that doesn't you know, talk like me or doesn't have the same theology as me, and, and that's not really necessarily a, a godly thing. The Second Great Awakening, it started with uh, Timothy Dwight. We talked about him in our Sunday school period. He was the grandson of Jonathan Edwards, and um, he went to a college which became known as Yale, and he entered into a debate with people who were following uh, the age of reason and, and the enlightenment rather than the word of God. And he began debating with them about how that the word of God is true and accurate. And so for, I think it was 25 years after that, uh, he preached every year a series on why the word of God is true and convinced them and people began to be saved. And, and those students went out all over and uh, began you know, evangelizing and making a huge difference. He's kind of the bridge between the first Great Awakening and the second Great Awakening. And the reason that that matters is, is simply, um, in addition to the new lights and old lights, now you have another term that I have to give you, it's the new methods and the old methods. And so the, the old method was to be God-centered and just preach and let God work it out. And, and if people were too emotional, you'd tell them to sit down and wait until after the service which is what they did in Jonathan Edwards' sermons. You sit down and, and we'll talk to you after I get done preaching kind of a thing. The new methods was we're going to go out into the fields, and well, that's sort of new light, or old, yeah, new light too. But to, we're going to plan a revival. We're going to tell people on a week from Friday or next Thursday, uh, two weeks from now, you know, there's a preacher coming and, and we're going to have time together. The reason they did that is because they lived on the frontier. There weren't churches everywhere. And so you would call people in for their camp meetings and fall meetings, and they would build, you know, large uh, cathedral, not cathedrals, but uh, large buildings or, or tents and things so that people would come. And the second Great Awakening was much more man-centered and manipulative. And so they would, they would sing songs, and, and the, the theologians of the second Great Awakening, uh, like Charles Finney and some other guys, they said, if you have to stand on your head and do tricks and, and you know, sing hymns and, and run up and down the halls to get people saved, then that's what you should do. And so it became an emphasis on uh, them creating the environment. The altar call came out of that. I think you, you're familiar with that. To, to manipulate people, you know, raise your hand if you believe this, and then you raise your hand. And now if you've raised your hand, then you need to come up here. And, and so they would carry it from one step to another step along the way. All of that being said, we would not appreciate that, but God used that too. I mean, God's funny like that, that he used it in ways that we could not imagine um, in terms of, of the moral character of our nation. Hospitals are named like Lutheran and Methodist, Baptist Hospital. That all came out of the Second Great Awakening and the social reforms that happened. In addition to that, I believe that people were genuinely saved. And, and God saves people in ways that we wouldn't necessarily think would be true or don't, they don't always, you know, when they're preaching, follow everything that we would say. God still does the sovereign work in the hearts of people. Uh, the best example of that is uh, the revivals that happened during the Civil War. Um, I've heard estimates and read stories anywhere between, you know, 10,000s to maybe 100,000 different soldiers north and south attended different camp meetings during after all, if you're going to be shot tomorrow and you might die, you're interested in, in the afterlife. Um, and a lot of these guys, specifically, we know what they did because of the letters that they sent home. So, you know, little Jimmy would say, I've been going to these gospel meetings for a month and, and I've repented of my sin and I've trusted in Jesus and I intend to live right. And, and their gospel messages are really clear in, in a lot of these letters. And so God used that. Um, for a lot of the people that died, uh, 500,000, 550,000 people died in the Civil War. So a bunch of those got to go to heaven because they were brought out of their communities and were placed together and heard a gospel and then had a, a quick exit to glory. And the other thing we know is that a lot of them, that they went home and they continued to serve. They continued to be faithful. They continued to believe. And so God used that also. And so I just would compare those two to say that 
there are some concerns about Asbury and what's going on. It does appear like it was pre-planned. Um, there were some advertisements by Francis Chan, who attended the same school that we attended, that he was going to go there and uh, take part in a revival that happened before everything that you've seen here. By the way, the reason that it came up is 50 years ago, so we're on the 50th anniversary of an original revival in Asbury, Kentucky, and so they were like wanting to repeat it. So I am skeptical for those reasons, and I'm, I'm going to give you a chance to talk about some of the other reasons that, that we could be skeptical, but I want to say this, that even though... Um, there may be problems with it. It doesn't mean that God won't use it in a great way. And I, w I want him to. I, I move to tears when I think about what would it be like if we would actually have a genuine revival, either like the Second Great Awakening or maybe the first, or, or like one of the earlier revivals that have happened in history. It would be wonderful. We are in a dark time. People are, are very hopeless. You know, there, there's a hundred reasons why why the youth of today are, are suicidal and whatnot, what better time would there be for God to begin to work? And so despite the fact that I, I don't know that everything looks good, I'm hopeful and praying that God will use maybe these imperfect actions in a greater way. Uh, in addition to Asbury, I've been reading that the revival has gone to a place known as Cedarville. Cedarville used to be a regular Baptist University. It's now just sort of Baptistic Bible, whatever. So it's more milk toast, generic. Um, but their their uh, theology and, and their doctrinal statement is as good as ours, or very close to what we would believe. And uh, when I've listened to people at that school talk about what what they're experiencing, it sounds pretty good. It sounds like they're being convicted of their sin. They're not trying to manipulate uh, along the way. But uh, one person said it like this, how do you know if a revival is true? In the end, the only thing you can do is wait and see. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that would be the case. What have you heard or read about Asbury that is significant? Yeah, there's, um, there's, it seems to be that everybody right now has an opinion about it. Mm -hmm. um, if you like look up a Google, or not a Google, if you, if you look up a, a Christian podcast or a Christian YouTube channel or something of um, generally solid commentators, you'll find that they're all talking about it and they're all over the map about <laughs> whether or not to say um, it, that it's a good, bad, or indifferent. Um, the, as I've been reading this book on the, especially the Second Great Awakening, Revival and Revivalism by Ian Murray, mm -hmm. He, um, he does a really good job of helping to look at American history or history of revivals and show that um, there's a distinction between a true work of God and a revival mm -hmm. and the means that are used for that, which is that the Spirit accomplishes it by, through the regular ministry, um, through the preaching of the Word of God. And what would be termed revivalism, which is where you just get people to do the right steps, like Pastor was talking about. So if I can get you to raise your hand, that I get you to come forward, I can get you to sit on the anxious bench, I can get you to be interested in Christ, and I'll call that a conversion. And um, then I'll put those numbers down, and we had 10 people converted today um, and entered the kingdom, um, when you don't know if that's true. But you got them to make the steps and stuff, and that comes, you, probably, you may have heard of the name Charles Finney, and he's the one who really popularized those new measures, or new methods, which you could call them. And so, um, what I think what we need to remember, though, is we believe in revivals, mm -hmm. one, um, an emotional experience in a Christian context or in a church context at a Christian university during a, during a worship music service, et cetera, et cetera, that doesn't um, necessarily in and of itself mean that there's uh, unusual work of the Spirit happening just because it's an emotional experience. Though, if you've come under conviction by the Holy Spirit, you're probably going to be um, pretty emotional. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so when we look at it, really, the, um, there's just a number of questions I have about the, the one at Asbury that really, it, you'll know it by its fruit, is really what it comes down to. We'll look back at it, and we'll see 
the products of it and we'll know, okay, wh what happened there was really a good thing. Um, Ian Murray says in that book, the test whether experience is of the spirit of God or of another spirit is whether or not it brings greater understanding of the Bible and a closer mm -hmm. obedience to it. And I think that's a really helpful, maybe rubric, if you wanna use that word, to mm -hmm. use when you're looking at something like this. What is the fruit that's gonna come out mm -hmm. of it? Um, so I know that there's a number of like New Apostolic Reformation, so that would be like Bethel Church uh, in Reading, which is not a church uh, and is not a house of God, despite what Bethel means. Um, and very charismatic, very health, wealth, success. They're the group that tried to raise a little girl who had died from the dead, and they had this crazy like music concert thing for four days as they were trying to, it kind of looks like the prophets of Baal with Elijah. Mm -hmm. Like they were doing everything they could to get God to raise this girl from the dead as if they could somehow um, change his will on that matter. Um, mm. And so that's, it's really not Christian. It's really heretical. And um, there's, so they're connected to what could be termed the New Apostolic Reformation where they think there's new apostles and that we're in this new reformation and we're in the end times and we're gonna um, just weird stuff that, that doesn't um, fit with with scripture um, and there's people connected to that greater movement I don't think specifically Bethel Church but that greater movement where they're trying to like get into this Asbury revival and sort of like take over and stuff um, it seems like most of it is just music I don't know how much teaching there is um, it's it started after a sermon about love and that we needed to 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 bring love into the world was basically his whole premise. So that's interesting, the spirit could use that, but that's not, there's nothing in there really about conviction of sin or, or the need of repentance and faith. Um, it's, it seemed, when I was looking at um, one article I was reading about it, um, there were some students that were on an upper level who were jumping during worship is what it said and so they were asked to move to the ground floor so it'd be safe. <laughs> um, and I thought, jumping during worship, okay, so does that maybe give me a window into the experience that they're feeling mm -hmm. that, that's happening there? But then there were also people that went there that said the feeling was one of um, like kind of a, uh, a sweet, quiet, like reflection on your life and on the Lord and on your need of him and that kind of thing. And so, so it seems like the opinions are all over the place. So I think really you just got to wait for, for the fruit to, um, to grow, to see, mm -hmm. to see what it looks like, but certainly pray that it's the real deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I get the feeling if revival comes from this, it won't ha actually have been there, but it will be others who are interested in it and begin to pray maybe because they are awakened to the reality or possibility, mm -hmm. and maybe they might repent yeah. and move forward. There is a book in the Bible that is based around the outline of revival, which is Second Chronicles. And when, when you read Second Chronicles, it is, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I heal their sin or forgive their sin and heal their land. And throughout the book, it's uh, one of the kings uh, does the first part and the next king who brings revival does the next part, and the next one does the next part. But it starts with my people. So revival has much more to do with the people of God rather than unbelievers. And if they repent and they respond to the truth, um, and if, if they turn from their wicked ways, those are the, are the I, I would say, the necessary biblical uh, qualities of what true revival would be mm -hmm. from Second Corinthians, Second Chronicles, excuse me. Chapter 7. Final questions, maybe? It, we had no idea when we would stop, but we, we'll come back out here. I decided to uh, seize the mic, so I guess I'll uh, give one more question. Um, I know we've been talking a little bit about uh, uh, the second commandment and the implications, and um, so that um, has to do with uh, you know, images of, of Jesus. And in particular, we can think about shows like The Chosen. Just wanted to have you guys maybe uh, address those for us? Sure. Yeah. Either one, you want me to go first? You go first? Okay. 
Um, we've had lots of discussions about it, and just like any two people, we might have described things a little bit differently. I think that's fair to say, but we do agree on, on the basic premises. Um, in, in, in terms of the second commandment, I've taught through the Ten Commandments a couple of three times, and I'm ready to do it again, I think. Um, the way that I handle the, the commandments is I believe that there is a truth given, and then you, you take that truth, and out of it you extract all kinds of wisdom. So, for example, the command, thou shalt not kill, teaches me, that, and I believe the Ten Commandments are, are designed to teach. Uh, it teaches me that not only can I not kill a person, I can't beat them within an inch of their life, and if I can't beat them, then I need to be charitable to them. And so the, the wisdom behind the, the command, thou shalt not kill, is I need to love my neighbor as myself. So all, all of those and probably other um, elements come out of each of the commandments. Um, my understanding of, of the, the second commandment is that it deals with the issue of not making idols, and, and for the purpose of, of worship, um, things like that. And then the wisdom that comes out of that would be things like we, we probably should not be painting pictures of Jesus. And you could include things like, is it wise to, to make a TV program where Jonathan, I think it's Rumi, mm -hmm. where Jonathan Rumi dresses up and, and looks like Jesus? It might not be wise. Um, and, and, and that's how, how I would break down the use of the Ten Commandments. I'm, I'm not willing to say uh, that the command commands me not to do all of those tertiary things. I think that those are, are the things in good conscience that I should apply to my life. So um, since, since the chosen is the issue, you know, no sense not talking about it, um, it's probably not a great show to watch. And if you're ever prone to think that Jonathan Rumi is Jesus or that your, your worship of the Lord increases by a program that you see or if, if you begin to understand the, the Bible even better because of a program put together by Mormons, and, and there's, there's, a, there's a hundred problems with it, and I'm not even sure that the Ten Commandments is the biggest problem, though it, it's a large one. I think a bigger problem is how insulting it might be to try and watch Jesus, how, how they're trying to flesh out what it means to be both God and man. I mean, I, I, when, when I've watched, you know, various ones, when, when I see what they try and do to, to pretend that Jesus doesn't know something or that he's surprised or, or that he can laugh, I, all of those are not very good. But at least personally, then I'd like for James even to talk about how, his viewpoint, which is just fine, perfect. Um, I do think in the end that it's a matter of conscience. And I, I think that in those areas that a person ought to take the wisdom of Scripture and be very cautious uh, in terms of handling it. But, and, and I'm happy for whatever you would say in addition. Yeah. Um, I, let me read this. This, is, this was um, in response to The Chosen. It was posted by somebody who I don't know on September 30, 2021 on, on Facebook. Jonathan Rumi is by far the best Jesus I've ever seen on stage or screen. His portrayal is so subtle, yet powerful, full of such compassion and sorrow, joy and humor, strength and vulnerability. It has hmm. restored my flagging faith. This is the Jesus I crave, the Jesus my heart has always longed for. Hmm. I'm starting to see Jonathan's face in my head when I pray. Is this idolatry? Probably. But if loving Jonathan's Jesus is wrong, I don't want to be right. So... <clears throat> Number of issues. Um, kind of let the reader understand this. Um, <laughs> it's, I think, uh, I was talking to you, Scott, earlier about this, and I think the best we could hope for, or, or the best thing that could occur from watching The Chosen is your view of Jesus is going to be altered. The worst mm -hmm. is you're going to worship a blasphemous idol. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably... Uh, more to do with your heart than the violation of the second commandment, if it does violate the second commandment. Um, but <clears throat> when, you, when you look at that kind of thing, and there's a number of other problems with the chosen, um, 
It's produced by a, a um, studio that's owned and operated and created by Mormons. Mm -hmm. um, mo the set that it's on is owned by the Mormon church. It's filmed in Utah. Um, the, some of the words that, G that Jonathan Rumi, <laughs> I can't say Jesus, that Jonathan Rumi <laughs> says are direct quotes from, from the Book of Mormon. Um, even if that was unintentional on the writer's part, if that's the case. Uh, every script and screenplay gets passed by a Jew, a Catholic, and a Protestant to make sure everybody agrees that it's okay. Um, the main funder of the show is the Mormon Church. Um, so there's a number of issues there. The guy that um, the main producer, director, I forget his name, Dallas Jenkins, there it is, um, says that the Mormons and Protestant Christians believe in the same Jesus, mm -hmm. uh, which categorically we do not. Mm -hmm. The Mormons believe in a created being as Jesus who earned a level of deity um, because he came to earth um, and obeyed a higher God who's not even the highest God. Mm -hmm. um, they believe that Jesus and Satan are brothers. They Do they even say... Michael and Jesus are the same person or something like that? No, not that one. That's Jehovah's Witness. That's Jehovah's Witness. Okay, excuse me. Getting the cults confused. Um, so it's bad, and Mormonism is really bad. So I would say, I, I, would, I think I would tell somebody if they asked me, should I watch The Chosen? I would say, don't watch it. Mm -hmm. um, I watched the movie Noah with Russell Crowe as Noah, and um, just because my friends were, and I was like, okay, whatever. If it had been The Passion of the Christ, I don't think I'd gone and seen it because I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known, like, is this right or wrong? And, um, but I watched the movie Noah, and now when I read the Old Testament, Russell Crowe's face comes to mind, and I have oh. to make an intentional choice to not think of that and to think of something else. So how much more if you watch The Chosen, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it really makes Jesus out to be um, a more human than divine, I would say. So there's a one there's one scene where James, I think it's James, is um, coming to him and asking why he hasn't been healed of something. I'm not sure exactly what the problem is. And Jonathan Rumi, who's supposed to be Jesus, says, basically brings it back to, you need to trust me that I believe in you. I'm like, no, Jesus doesn't believe in you. You believe in him. Mm -hmm. So I think when you look at it, like at best, you're going to get confused. But at worst, it's going to corrupt your faith. So I would say stay clear of it. But it's ultimately a wisdom call. And, and you, need to make, you need to choose how you're going to make that wisdom call. So, yeah. Gary. Matthew 24, it says, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you skip down to verse 23. And if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, that even the elect. Not that, not that the chosen is doing that, but you can see how it could happen. Mm -hmm. Look how many people have watched. I, I checked the number, maybe... I don't know, six months ago, it was like 458 million people have, have watched The Chosen. Do you think those verses could apply? It, is, that, is it a danger? Is it a warning? Should it be a warning to us to be careful in light of Matthew 24? I think that verse is talking about people who are pretending to be Christ and claiming to be him. So I think the, if you would have a strict interpretation of that verse or a strict application would be looking at um, people who claim to be Christ. There's been a lot of people in history who've claimed to be Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, the Antichrist uh, mm -hmm. is yet to come. But, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't have a problem saying there's, there's a principle in there that would even inform us as we seek to be biblically wise in handling something like the chosen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think that would be wrong. You know, what, what I'm saying is I can see how that it could be perverted. 
that um, this could be slightly altered and it could go from being good to being not good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And images are really powerful. We, um, the Lord gave us a book to tell us about him. Um, and he didn't, he didn't paint us a picture. Images are very powerful. They stick in our minds. They, they capture our imagination, to use a phrase a fellow pastor used. Um, so, yeah, we need to be careful. A follow-up with that is since so many people have watched that show, if Jonathan Rumi, the actor, dressed as he did in the show, should go walking into a church or down the street... I think a lot of people could be fooled into saying, there's Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I mean, in the age we live in, when technology makes things that are ridiculous seem reasonable, I, I can see that that's kind of the step maybe the Gary was thinking about. Uh, people equate him with Jesus now. Yep. They probably would, yeah. And he's a, he's a Roman Catholic. He's a practicing Roman Catholic. And he, um, he uses his platform on his social media uses his reach he has now as Jesus to um, mm -hmm. get people into the Catholic Church. So mm -hmm. there's, even, there's even that to think about. But, mm -hmm. yeah. Would suggest he's not on his way to heaven. Right. You will not see the real Jesus. It would at least suggest that. At least at yeah. this point, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is uh, 727 or something like that. Yeah. So We've had way too much fun. I, I bet they haven't had as much fun as we have. We have these conversations every other day. Yeah, so, we do. Yeah. <laughs> We are grateful to be able to serve and, and be a part of the, the body, which is you all. And uh, we would covet your prayers immensely that uh, we could continue to serve until the Lord comes. I think he's coming soon. And um, no one did ask me what my greatest concerns were. Um, I, I expected that to come back to me. And, and they are that we would live holy lives and be ready for the return of Christ and that we would not have hearts that are cold. Uh, in, in a sense, uh, you, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but um, I've been preaching um, since, since I did the series on revival for revival. I, I think that I have. Just in every passage, trying uh, to have us see God in a more wonderful way and love Christ more. And uh, whether or not it happens in Asbury, I think it can and may be happening here. So uh, thank you for your, your commitment and uh, love and support for us. Pray that God will continue to, to guard each one of us and, and keep us together until he comes. Let's bow in prayer and we'll be done. Lord, we do thank you tonight for your love and grace. Thank you for the patience of our people and the love that is so obvious in the hearts of each one. Give us wisdom as we go home tonight and we pray that the things we said tonight will have been pleasing to you and valuable to our hearts and minds. Just pray for uh, Bonnie as... In a, in a week or so, she'll have a procedure that all will go well. We care for her and, and are concerned. And we think of Abby, who is uh, destined to give birth to a child in this next week on Wednesday. Pray that you would have your hand of blessing in that room also. And we pray that you would come soon. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.